Hi, John. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Ah, great. Great. Considering it's Thursday and feels like Monday, but you know what? I'm 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 doing all right. Good. Um, so obviously, along with your studio, you've got the Blackbird Academy. What were some yes. of the ways that you kind of learned engineering, and were there particular things about that that influenced how you wanted to start or kind of work with younger students? Well, what happened was the studio has been around since 2002. So we've gone through lots and lots and lots of interns. And generally our interns are graduates from a program. It could be a short program. It could be a year program, a four-year program. But I was shocked to discover that even after getting through a four-year program, I felt like most of these kids did not have any idea of how to really make a record. So it bothered me. <laughs> and then add to that the fact that maybe they owe a hundred grand or 150 grand for all the tuition and, and, and the college, it just adds insult to injury. So I thought, you know, you can, bitch about things or you can do something about it. I much prefer to uh, do something about it. Uh, it was probably 2011. I was sitting up front waiting on someone or something and Vance Powell and I were up there together and, and um, we had four interns up there and we asked, what's your favorite kick drum, Mike? Well, the responses were, ah, I didn't really get to mic much drums, you know, and I went, wait, but you graduated, right? I mean, miking drums is a pretty big deal. You know, it's important. To, well, we only had an SM57 or whatever, you know. Anyway, it was really unsatisfactory answers. So I thought to myself, well, the only way to remedy that situation is let's try to do it ourselves. And it took a couple of years but starting in the fall of 2013, we um, we started the Blackbird Academy. I my first phone call was to Mark Rubel, who had, was teaching audio in Illinois and had been for 20, 25 years at the time. I think he had brought a class down on his own accord to have a tour of the studio. So that's how I met Mark initially. But I was thoroughly impressed with the guy. You know, he looks like Lou Reed, sounds like Albert Einstein, you know. He's just a really great, great guy and beautiful temperament, great attitude. He's a bass player also, has his own, had his own studio, Pogo Studios in Champaign, Illinois. And uh, that was my first phone call, and he agreed. And then Tom Kenny from Mix Magazine told me about Kevin Becca, who had been teaching for about 10 years at, at another school, and that he was getting frustrated for whatever reason, I don't know. But I called Kevin, and he blew me away also. And then I thought, shit, can I afford these two guys, you know? I mean, because they're world class, both of them. Well, you know what? You'll find a way, and I did. And so Kevin and Mark and I sat down and they put together the curriculum. Our, our motto was, or our mantra more likely is, uh, was um, the greatest education in the shortest amount of time for the least amount of money possible. So we came up with a six month program which to this day I sometimes think should be six years because you never stop learning, you know, you never. But um, we put together a program and started in the fall of 2013, so we're about to have our six-year anniversary. Lost money the first three years. The last two years we've turned a little profit, so we're off double secret probation by the state of Tennessee, you know. We're a post-secondary educational institution is our formal title, but, you know, it's a trade school. If you love music and you want to work in music, come here. 
I think there's a certain percentage of the population that when they're born and they're in the womb, when they hear their mother's heartbeat and the sound of her voice and the sound of that blood flowing through her veins, I think that music gets ingrained into your DNA. And I think that's a lot of who I see here, you know, are people that are like-minded like that. So anyway, we um, started this school and I'm happy to say that we have two programs, a, um, a studio recording program and a live engineering program. On the live side, I think I know we're well over 90% employed. These kids, these grads are working. There's so much live work, it's ridiculous. And not just touring, but work in theaters and arenas, being the house guy or, or in clubs. Uh, um, kids are working in their churches. We get that a lot of that too, you know, it's interesting. We've had artists come through the program who simply want to make better demos and understand the recording process better. We've had, it's interesting because a lot of, <laughs> well, like Alison Krauss, her son came through the program. She also sponsored another girl to come through the program. Um, Greg Wells' son came through the program. program. And now his ex-wife, Louise Goffin, is in the program. It's crazy, you know, the fact that she's made a great number of records and has an incredible musical heritage, you know, being the daughter of Carole King and Jerry Goffin. And um, so I think part of, you know, we've had the drummer from uh, Train, Scott Underwood, came through the program. It's it's really interesting who signs up here, but it's gone very very well, and we it's become one of the most important things in my life, mentoring younger people or even older people, whatever, as to where the bar is. You know, you want uh, the art of recording cannot be lost. I don't care how digital we get. You know, the placement of the mic, the balance of what you've recorded you know there's standards that need to be uh recognized and and that's part of the magic and the emotion of music you know i guess you can ask me one question i'll just talk for an hour and then we'll be done right no that's a good thing <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway we have the school it's going great on this on the studio side we're over 70 percent employed which you're never happy until ev <clears throat> until everyone is working but with the state of the business and how hard it is and how many people are recording and how little money there is um compared to the past in making records i'm very very happy that over 70 percent of our studio grads are employed and working and you know we have kids all over the world the beauty of it is we we're not accredited at this point you have to we're getting ready to apply for accreditation which means you can go to the government to get a loan um, you have to have two years of profitability before you can even apply and so we just recently accomplished that and um, It'll take a year and a half or two years for that to happen, but that's okay. Three or four or four years ago, we got approved to take international students, which I'm very happy about. And um, they, you know, and we are also hooked up with the, the veterans, you know, the GI Act where you can get, if you've been in the military at all, you can get a scholar or a funding to go to this school, which I'm happy about. So it's an interesting time, you know. I think 95% of the time when you own a studio, you think, how in the hell can I survive? What ways can I make money aside from booking a room? Because that seems to be one of the hardest things to do. <laughs> but somehow we've managed to uh, stay above the fray. 
we're getting into other type work. We're doing a lot of transfer work these days too. What with the UMG fire, you know, that came to light recently that happened back in 2008, there's been more awareness for preserving your original tapes and recordings and transferring them and having them in two or three different places so you never have to worry about losing them, you know. Do you tend to teach kind of recording techniques via era or via just kind of sound or genre? Um, you know what? We expose our kids to so many different influences and we let them figure out what they love and what, you know, what they like in the way of, of sound. Um, I work with every class, at least a couple of days of recording, but they get, and every student in the recording program has to find a band, record them, overdub them, mix them. You know, you can't do that without, you can't graduate without that. Um, they also have literally, I believe, hundreds of guest lecturers you know, from Andrew Sheps to Joe Ciccarelli to Nico Bolas to, oh my God, the list goes on and on and on. And um, there are field trips where you'll go visit stacks and different, or you'll go to Memphis for sure, uh, probably um, to um, Alabama to visit, um, oh my God, I'm mental blocking. Uh, Muscle shows. Yes, thank you, uh, to visit Muscle Shoals. And, uh, you know, the, the beauty of Blackbird, or one advantage we have here, is we have an incredible gear collection. And you'll be able to use, you know, U47s and 251s and M50s and great microphones, C12s. 67s, 49s, 48s, the list goes on and on. And it'll help you realize how important the placement of a mic is and the right mic for the job. And that the bar is here, that when you put the right mic in front of the right input in the right room, magic happens. And it's really, it's real. And um, I also know that when they leave here, they're going to be recording in their buddy's basement or whatever with probably three SM57s and maybe an Apollo or something, you know? So we teach all of it. And I'll guarantee I've heard some great, great drum sounds coming out of three SM57s placed right, even in a not great room. So we focus on now we have obviously the latest greatest pro tools and we have logic we have you know different digital recording formats but we also have a bunch of vintage classic gear so that you know they learn they learn how to splice tape you know what tape smells like man that's kind of cool in my opinion you know it's good to know and to compare digital recording to analog recording, it's nice. We've got some in the box rooms here and we have a bunch of rooms that are analog. So the good news is you'll get the whole spectrum when you come attend this school or just come work here, period. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is what you'll discover, you'll learn how to listen here also, how to understand what you're hearing, because that is, you know, it's a process. But the higher quality at which you listen to music, the more emotional it becomes. And that's just the truth. I always say, you know, we have, I have a bunch of stupid little sayings, you know, uh, good is the enemy of great. And let me tell you, that is one of my favorites because it's so true. Good. There's two million good songs on the internet, and I don't give a fuck about any of them. 
but a great song, you know, I'll stab you in the neck with a pencil to get that song. I want to hear, I want that song. I want it. I want to hear it when I want to hear it. You know, great makes things happen. Good. Eh, what's the point? If you ever see a Blackbird t-shirt on the back, it says either you rock or you suck. And all that means is if you're going to do something, just do it right. You know, don't half-ass it. That's all. I cuss too much, probably. I hope that doesn't. I hope that's okay. No, uh, it's fine. I, my wife claims I don't have a filter, and she's probably right. Usually, with these interviews, I like to kind of go through some different instruments and talk about favorite techniques and mics. Obviously, with you, there's quite a lot of options. So maybe it's just kind of some there of the are. first things that come to your head in terms of favorites. My favorite kick drum mic, RCA forty four ribbon mic about a foot away from the drum not near the hole i don't want wind hitting it cut 200 add 50 it's godlike and a rca 44 will record 10 cycles i'll guarantee you there they've got a beautiful beautiful low end you know a snare there's always you know an sm57 is on 95 percent of the snare of the snares you ever, ever heard recorded and I have no issue with the 57. I love them. I use a C12 on the bottom snare. Um, I like a C12 on the hi-hat and overheads. I'm American, so I got to go condensers, right? Even though I love certain ribbons on overheads, too. You know, KU3A, which could be my favorite ribbon mic. It's an old RCA mic. They're incredible. I like 67s on toms because I can. But you know what? A 421... God, it's pretty, pretty, pretty great. You know, Josephson on the toms works great also. The little lollipop-looking thing. Um, at the end of the day, if you have the right performance, the three SM57s will do the job and make the point. That's the beauty of it. But when you can really be an audio snob and use the best shit in the whole world. It, why not? You know, hopefully we combine the magic of the performance with the magic of the recording process and we get magic times magic, you know, that's what we're all looking for. Electric guitars. I like a BK five B RCA ribbon. You know, no, it's like a 421. It's got that nice little hump around 2.5K, and that turns guitar players on. So, hey, why not? I like um, a 582 on the neck of a, of an acoustic guitar. I like a 67 on the body. But I'll tell you, a KM54 doesn't suck either. They're pretty great. There's a new mic I tried out just yesterday called a Saunderson, S-O-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And I don't even know how available they are yet. It sounded really great. It's kind of a 251-like clone. It's similar in the way it works and how it sounds. But it's way less expensive than a 251, which is kind of nice. Um, other favorites? Well, my wife sings on a 251 Telefunken. But... Not just any 251, it's serial number 584. It's the best 251 I've ever heard out of 100, probably. And it sounds like God. And it's not. It's an export version, so it's got a 6072 tube. I don't want to get all geeky and, you know, because I'm not really a techie guy. But it's a an export version, so the 6072 tube, which is way cheaper than an AC701, which we're in the are in the 251s that were non-export. But that 584 has some magic to it that, of course, I love, you know, I put together her vocal chain. It goes from the mic to a Telefunken B76M mic pre, out of that into an 1176, out of that into a Mono Fairchild, and out of that into a Motown EQ. It's a beautiful chain. So even if the EQ's flat, and I'm not even hitting the compressors. Just the sound of those circuits is so beautiful to my ears. And it just, you know, Martina, she sounds like ice cream with a little whipped cream on top. You know, it's kind of beautiful. It really is. 
I don't like, you know, 3K is my least favorite frequency of the spectrum. 3.15, 2.5, 5 k is not too far behind. I like a smooth mid-range, you know, or upper mid-range. And 200 to 1K could be the most important part of a vocal mic. Um, having clarity, but warmth, you know, I want to feel like I'm getting hugged by that voice. And man, I love that experience. Um, I usually put a C12 on a bass cabinet. I just like the clarity of the C12, you know. There's always plenty of low end on a bass, and you have a DI also usually. I use Motown DIs. Piano, I like M49s. And a trick that Jeff Emmerich taught me, I asked him, how'd you mic the piano on Lady Madonna? Which I thought was probably an upright, but it wasn't, it was C7. And it was one mic, a D19C, the English SM57, as I call it. It's a workhorse mic, you know. You'll see people singing on them. You'll put them on kick drums. You'll put them on guitars, whatever. And he had one D19, crushed the shit out of it with a BA86 or a BA6A or an Altec compressor and 2.7K to taste. Jeff was so free with his knowledge and so happy to pass it on. And the first time I did that in a session with that mic, the piano player about shit his pants, man, it was awesome. What is that? I got ah, just an old trick a buddy of mine taught me, you know. <laughs> See, how many other things does Jeff Emmerich know or did he know that no one is aware of? You know, I hate that. So we try to keep the art of recording and the art of audio relevant today because I think it matters. You want to ask me something else or should I? I mean, I, I can tell you some other shit like a didgeridoo or a, you know, whatever. But I always keep a 47 on the session as a, as a guest mic or a spare mic because, you know, people wander in. Oh, my buddy plays tambourine or, you know, he's a great percussionist. You guys got any bongos? What are, you know, and so... I want to have. I don't want to have to take the time to set up another mic and slow down the magic. You know, being prepared is critically important. Al Schmidt, you know, he'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. Boy, I subscribe to that also, especially if you're engineering, because or assisting or any of that. You know, it all matters. You wanna. You wanna try to stay ahead of the flow and be on top of things. It's important. Are there any very minimalist drum micing techniques that you find yourself returning to? Sure, the Glenn John setup that everybody tries. Um, it works beautifully, by the way. I like to, you know, it's, it's basically a an overhead and something usually by the floor tom equal distant from the snare and then a kick mic. Um, I've seen guys do a four mic version of that where they add another mic to the snare just so they have a little more control. What you'll find is I've mic kits with two mics before, but what has to happen is the drummer has to hear it so he can play to that because if the toms are too loud, back off on the toms a little bit. If the snare isn't loud enough, maybe hit it harder. Um, but there's a beauty to using fewer mics because from a physics point of view, you have fewer problems, you know, less comb filtering or, you know, sounds reaching the mics at different times, basically phasing. Um, but man, you know, what I'll do a lot of times, and I love it, is I'll close mic everything, and then I'll do a three mic setup on top of that. And it's great. It is. The Kings of Leon are over in D right now. God, they've been there forever, three months. And they're using probably 35 mics on the drum kit. You know? I can't wait to hear what is going on, you know? 
It's kind of beautiful. We also just added an Atmos room, a Dolby Atmos room to Blackbird Studio C, which was designed by George Massenberg. If you if you go online, you see a picture. It's people call it the stick room because there's 138,646 pieces of one by one inch wood coming off the walls. No two pieces are the same length, and it creates diffusion, especially from about three or 400 cycles up to about four or five K. Like we wouldn't even have heard that bell. The system we have installed in that room is a 9.1.6. The first number nine, that's how many speakers are at eye level. There's three in front of you, three down your left side, three down your right side. The point one means sub, even though we have six subs in there, it's point one. And then the point six at the end are flown speakers, speakers that are above your head, you know, three left, three right. And this creates this cone of audio and they call it immersive audio. And you feel like you're in the middle of it and it's life changing. It's unbelievable. It's such a freedom of having 15 full range speakers to put audio through you're not trying to cram everything into two speakers left and right in this linear plane and it's magic it it i cannot wait for you to hear it it and the beautiful thing is universal's having 2000 songs put into this format amazon and netflix are requ requiring all their um all their content to be mixed in Atmos. People are building sound bars that go in your house where you can put one in the front of your room and it'll have speakers that are aimed up that'll bounce off the ceiling so you get this illusion that it's behind you. And there, <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of synergy right now focused on making Atmos work. Not to mention 4,500 Dolby Atmos theaters around the world. But hearing it in a control room, man, it's the best. It is. Have you got? What do you want to go from here? Have you got any <laughs> favorite mics that have come out in the last kind of ten years? Favorite mics? Yeah. Well, you know what? I've always been a fan of Shure mics. I like AEA. You know, I like. Wes Dooley's mics, I like, there's some good ribbons, you know. Um, I won't say anything's changed my life, but I like this Saunderson mic. I'm still, I'm going to put Martina on that and hear her, and then I'll really, really have an opinion on it because I know that voice so well. Um I'm glad that Neumann re-released the U67 with the uh, same hardware, same power supply. I love that. I think it was incredibly smart move on their part because that's one of the four mics that changed the world, really. I call them good guy mics. You know, mics that you can use on any input, and they work great. 421s, 57, C12, 251. Maybe not a 251 on the snare drum, but you know what? On most other inputs, it's great. Um, U47, yeah, U67, those are, are all wonderful mics. But you know what? I really, I'll tell you what I love on horns, especially for touring. A 4099 and 4061, those are model numbers. Let me Look, let me just look that up real quick because I love those mics and they are roadworthy and rarely do I need to uh, to um, use any EQ on those they just sound really really great okay I'll tell you who it is right now DPA, Jesus Christ, man. I'm only 61. I don't know why 
you know, I'm having these senior moments. But a DPA, I love those microphones in general. I like 4099s on horns. I like 4061s on stringed instruments, you know, acoustic or violin, cello. Um, so, yeah, I've been a little vague, but I think we're still making good microphones. Can you think of any particularly unusual places you've recorded? Maybe kind of really difficult rooms or that sort of thing? I won't say it was difficult, but I got to spend a couple of weeks on Paul Allen's yacht, The Octopus, which has a studio on the sixth floor, making a Dave Stewart record. And that was, well, it's surreal, basically. We finished, I wanted to sue everybody because they ruined my life. I could never be happy again after spending two weeks on The Octopus, you know. But working with Dave, which is such a pleasure always because he's so creative, unbelievably creative, was great. And we made great music. And shockingly, the drone of the motors didn't put us out of business. You know, there was enough isolation that it worked out pretty well. I, I brought a bunch of microphones with me because... What they kept on the boat, I think due to the exposure to salt water or whatever, or mist in the air, they didn't have a lot of classic condenser mics, so I brought some with me and used them, and that helped. Um, but no, we had a great time on that. That was definitely the most unique recording experience I've had. What are some ways that you've kind of worked with Bleed over the years? especially maybe more unusual ways that come to mind. Worked with what over the years? Lead. Ah. Well, you know, it depends on what you want. Um, if everyone wants to be in the same room and you use a few mic setup, it's uh, more a question of balance because everything bleeds. Um, when an, uh, a guitar player, an acoustic player is also a vocalist, you know, you got to choose the right mic for the vocal and the acoustic. Because let's say he plays a perfect acoustic part, but he bones a vocal, and now they're so, they bled into each other so much. So, the tighter pattern that you can afford to use on an acoustic guitar, the better, easier it's going to be for you later. Um, we have such good isolation at Blackbird that fortunately, I don't have to worry about it too much. It really just depends on the desire of the artist and if they want to sit in a circle or how they want to do that. It, it's hard to get the necessary separation you want um, when that is the case. But there's an art to it, like everything else. And that blend can work and be great. You know, it, it, it works, or it can work. But certain mics are tighter pattern than others. So I would recommend, you know, like a buyer m160 or something on the acoustic they don't pick up much if any vocal when you're using that so there's you know a lot of tricks i, I you know i don't have the enlightenment of jeff emmerich yet where i'll just give away every secret i know but almost you know <laughs> with all the gear that you have what does your mix plus normally look like on the stereo mix bus, I'll generally use a Neve 33609 with the metal knobs. I like that model. Um, a pair of EMI EQs from the mastering console. I think we have 10 channels of the EMI EQ. I bought other channels that were available from other consoles. Um, but, and occasionally I'll use a smart C2. And it has that crush function that just puts hair on everything. And in some music, that's preferable, and in a lot of it, it isn't. But you don't have to use the crush function either. So, 
And, you know, I like an API 2500 in general. So those are probably three of my, you know, I, I have Fairchilds, but I use them more for either a drum crush function or maybe room mics. Um, I've used a distressor on room mics in the nuke mode if you want to get really radical and play with stuff. Um, I really love the Chandler TG1 or TG2 in the limit mode. It Those symbols just ring forever. It's kind of beautiful. So compression is a great thing when it's used right. You know, I, I love... I like the Neve, probably the 33609 is probably my favorite stereo bus compressor. Then they're just going to crush the fuck out of it mastering anyway, so you do what you got to do. But I use the 33609 live also. I just feel like it's that important. And a pair of EMI EQs. So I like those too. Just to finish up, could you maybe talk about some of the session, sessions you've been on that have kind of meant the most to you and that you kind of, that just the kind of maybe the first ones that come to mind? Got to make a wreck. Well, I love working with my wife, Martina. It's, it's, it's just magic. I'm very fortunate I get to do that. I made a Stevie Nicks record I really love three or four years ago. Um, Man, I wasn't on the session, but I sat in on a lot of it. Queen was here prior to the movie coming out, and they were doing some music for that. That was life-changing in a way. Brian May could be the nicest person I've ever met. I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's so great when you love an artist or a band, and they end up being great people. That's, that's a great thing. But you know what? I'll bust my balls just as hard for any club band as I will for, you know, any rock star, really. You know, it's either in you or it's not. And I love it. Every time I go into a session, I want it to be the greatest sounds that were ever recorded. You know, that's my goal. So, you know, you got to grab some cool gear so you can cheat a little, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. 